Hi everyone, I'm Krishna Karwa, a senior research analyst with IFAS Financial India Private Limited. In today's video, we will touch upon the Nippon India Taiwan Equity Fund. To shed light on what uh, this product is all about and to know more about Taiwan, I have with me Mr. Rajesh Jairaman, who is the deputy head for product management at Nippon India AMC. His experience in the financial services domain spans over two decades, of which 15 years are with Nippon AMC alone. So at the outset, hi Rajesh, glad to have you with us. Uh, so as I just mentioned, a lot of people typically associate Taiwan with semiconductors. But I'm sure there is much more to uh, this particular country than just semiconductors. Uh, can you talk us through uh, some of the other products that assume importance in the context of this country? Sure. Uh, thanks, Krishna. Uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity to speak to you and through you to your uh, partners. Uh, the country itself is quite fascinating, to be honest with you, uh, because as you rightly said, a very, very small country, something geographically 90 times, 91 times smaller than our own uh, country. But uh, if you look at a lot of other parameters on the development side, they have scaled up quite a number of height for a small country of their size. So the unique differentiation uh, or the advantage that country enjoys is a significant heads up when it comes to technology, when it comes to electronic space. In fact, a lot of us would recollect even in the 80s and 90s, from our television panels to the early part of our computers, a lot of them used to have the label of made in Taiwan. So Taiwan always had this expertise when it came to the electronics uh, space. So today, as you rightly said, because of the semiconductors, which is in the news and a lot of uh, internet of things, to be honest, uh, got accelerated in the pandemic uh, scenario where a lot of us started new ways of working, working from home or learning from home, uh, even shopping from home. So everything uh, changed. In fact, today, technology has changed the way we look at uh, the, the world. So that's a dominant factor uh, for which Taiwan is known. Uh, hence, there is a bit of an apprehension, you could say, by a lot of investors. Probably is it just a single uh, uh, sector-based economy? But the answer is no. First of all, the semiconductor itself. Let me elaborate a little bit here. Uh, because while it is looks like a single uh, kind of segment sector, the fact is the usage of semiconductor is quite, quite varied. So it covers multiple fields, something as, as mundane as a consumer durable, like a AC or a washing machine or a fridge also uses intelligent uh, technology, which is nothing but chips. The semiconductor actually popularly we call it as uh, uh, chips. And it goes to very, very high end, high processing uh, uh, computing. In fact, the next generation technology, which all of us are talking about from 5Gs to AI to EVs, all of them will be powered by chips. So the usage is quite varied. So while it's one single segment which uh, stands out, obviously, uh, if you look at the exports part, uh, which you asked me uh, from a country point of view, around 34% of their exports actually go into electronic space, of which semiconductor is a part of. Another 15 odd percent, uh, 14 to 15 percent, uh, goes into uh, information devices, communication, audio, video kind of devices, which also obviously will have some play into the semiconductor space. So roughly you could say about 50% of the economy uh, is more towards electronics and the uh, related uh, kind of manufacturing areas. They also have some bit of exports uh, of scale. For example, a bit of base metals is there. Uh, rubber is another export uh, area. Plastics is another export area. So that's, that's the diversification which is which is there. But the core competence uh, which, which drives the competitive advantage for the economy is on the electronics manufacturing uh, space. And this is very varied. So uh, I don't know if most of the people uh, would be aware of this call. Taiwan actually has uh, nine Fortune 500 companies, and not all of them are semiconductor companies. So uh, out of those nine, uh, around four or five of them are more into manufacturing of electronic uh, items, the computer peripherals, the telecom handsets. In fact, one of the main, which is called Hanhoi Precision uh, Company, uh, which is known by Foxconn. So Foxconn is a well-known brand, right? All of us in India know about Foxconn. In fact, they have a, a big support uh, they give to Apple and, and similar other brands uh, worldwide. So, so in that sense, you have multiple other uh, businesses, but a lot of them have linkage to the electronic space and that's the key advantage. 
the uh, country has. So uh, probably one should not uh, get uh, uh, mistaken uh, by thinking that it's just a one segment. But the usage of uh, the semiconductor itself or chips itself today is is varied. And hence, uh, in our own view and whatever understanding we get from the, the market experts, we believe the demand for this particular aspect will only keep growing as long as we believe uh, we live in the information age, information technology age, and things from a technology perspective are only going to get more and more complex as we go forward. That's quite interesting, Rajesh. Mm, a, a country as small as Taiwan making the impact that it is, and uh, being such a key enabler for our functions all this while. Right. So, fact, uh, yes. Sorry, I'm saying, in fact, the, the way we are conversing today also has a lot of uh, uh, support from Taiwan coming in in the form of uh, chips, uh, which is helping us converse on a platform uh, through the internet of uh, uh, internet platform, actually. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, Rajesh, uh, that brings me to the next question where uh, there have been a lot of concerns about uh, the prospects of a further upside in the semiconductor space, uh, given that um, valuations are, um, have already been so steep and uh, factors such as uh, vaccination drives and uh, returning back to work are commonly heard terms. So uh, your thoughts on that. And in fact, there are, there's also... Uh, a lot of uh, capex happening on this front in some pockets of the globe so uh, taking all of these factors into account uh, do you reckon there could be more steam left in a space like chips sure that's a very interesting uh, question krishna sure that's there in, in minds of a lot of uh, uh, people who are looking at uh, investing in taiwan uh, the fact is this technology is quite different uh, from what we normally associate with and it is just not a brick and mortar kind of manufacturing kind of stuff, uh, which we normally think can be easily replicated worldwide. Uh, just to give you some idea of what I'm trying to hint at. Uh, for example, today, uh, we are all looking at the rollout of 5G to happen very shortly, correct? Right? And similarly, new age technologies, uh, which will be required for powering the artificial intelligence, the cloud computing, um, even the EVs, all of them today are going to be built upon a system uh, where the size of the chips or the wafer is going to be so thin that it is going to be, it's, it's something like 5 nanometers. And uh, if you look at the entire world, uh, there are only two countries and in fact very few companies in those countries who are capable of building anything less than 10 nanometers. So one of them is Taiwan and with a disproportionately high uh, market share. By some estimates, obviously we don't have the exact numbers, but some estimates put it almost 80% of the capability to build uh, 10 nanometers and lower uh, in terms of the chip size lies with Taiwan. So, so that tells you the uh, differentiated technology which they have access to today, something which cannot be easily replicated worldwide. You are absolutely right, a lot of CapEx has been uh, planned by a uh, lot of countries to try and be more uh, self-reliant when it comes to the semiconductor manufacturing because semiconductors are nothing but brain of the uh, technology. So any technological uh, things they want to uh, upgrade themselves to, they would need a brain to power it, which is nothing but chips. So for instance, US had announced about 52 billion uh, out of their overall uh, uh, infra spending or budget spending towards this particular area to study more into the semiconductor space. Similarly, a lot of other countries, including India, we have been trying to uh, set up plans, but the whole process itself is quite complex. The time taken is estimated to be anywhere between two to four years. It requires a quite a big amount of investments, about 25 to 30 billion uh, US dollars is what it's normally estimated to set up a manufacturing unit. It's called a foundry or a fab. I'm sure this kind of terms uh, uh, most of us would have heard in the recent past. One of, first of all is time taken. Second is you need very skilled manpower, which is very rare to find worldwide. So that is the bigger uh, challenge which comes in. So in a way, you could say that leads us to the uh, uh, understanding that the unique advantage or the competitive advantage or the mode which uh, a country like Taiwan would have when it comes to specialized manufacturing of the advanced kind of uh, chip technologies is quite high. And that is something uh, which can stay uh, for quite some time to come. Uh, just to give you one more interesting fact, uh, if you look at the overall global production of the semiconductors, 52% of that manufacturing is, is market share is towards Taiwan. 
and the next biggest country is china at about 17% and followed by korea at about 12 or 13% so what it tells you is not only is taiwan the biggest chip maker worldwide they also have uh, a very big gap vis-a-vis uh, -vis the next bigger competitors so we think that again leads to us to believe that the the advantage which they have is likely to sustain for quite some time to come and valuations have not really risen from a equity market perspective so while you are right that the pricing could have uh, changed and they would have uh, slightly increased the pricing to take uh, benefit from the prevailing higher demand for for chips we don't think it will hurt the long term profitability in any significant manner anyways the high it's, it's a fairly high margin business for them because the cost of manpower on relative terms compared to some of the other developed uh, kind of nations is relatively lower for them access to technology and the capability to go into more advanced areas of the chip uh, building uh, capabilities is much higher with with uh, taiwan so so we think they are in a fairly good space uh, as i said as long as we believe the information technology requirements is only uh, uh, will only keep growing uh, taiwan has a very very strong merit uh, from an investment perspective right intriguing in fact you know, a lot of concerns around this space have been comprehensively addressed by you and i'm sure uh, all the viewers will find this quite helpful as well uh, in understanding why uh, this product uh, is uh, definitely one uh, to reckon with sure. okay so uh, rajesh another uh, big concern that is uh, plaguing markets globally is that you know, there are raw material shortages and logistical challenges with uh, shipping rates etc on the uh, rise so uh, how do you assess this situation in the context of uh, taiwan's manufacturing capabilities and uh, what steps is the government uh, out there uh, taking to address these concerns yeah that's again a fair fair uh, uh, question actually uh, so what is interesting to note again uh, from a taiwan's perspective they hardly were impacted uh, by the uh, pandemic and its challenges in fact for most of last year 2020 uh, they were they were uh, lucky and and the level of infections were quite uh, low for them uh, even uh, this particular year barring couple of months uh, between may and june they were largely having fairly low amount of uh, infections so there was hardly any pandemic led disruption especially on the manufacturing part it was hard Any disruption. Uh, so, where did the supply shortage come from? That's one query which could be there in in a lot of investors' mind. Why did the chip, uh, chip shortage start in such a big way? The reason for that is the demand went through the roof once things started normalizing. After the initial part of the pandemic, uh, the first two three months, people were not very sure. In fact, uh, naturally, people scaled down the production of chips because everybody believed that there will be a slowdown for demand. But once things started normalizing, and thanks to a lot of uh, the policy support. Uh, which came in across the world uh, in terms of easy liquidity and lower rates and a lot of other stimulus efforts there was a big demand for uh, advanced chips uh, because uh, the demand for durables the demand for automobiles the demand for computers and and similar stuff like laptops and everything went up significantly along with the need for uh, the the wireless communication services telecommunication services the healthcare devices so on and so forth so the demand explosion was so sharp then actually the 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 uh, capacities had to be increased but it obviously doesn't happen overnight so it, it takes time so today we could see a lot of the challenges especially when it comes to the slightly lower end kind of technology used in automobiles and similar other products are getting addressed to a large extent uh, in fact uh, some of the taiwan is uh, chip makers uh, actually increased the production quite a bit this year almost 50 60% kind of jump in productions was seen over the last uh, uh, couple of quarters So what it means is that there was hardly any impact from a supply side towards the production of uh, the semiconductors so it's not to say that they are not getting access to raw materials and stuff like that anyways the raw materials required for that is not such very complex uh, so it's basically uh, pure sand and and water is obviously a very big component of the entire manufacturing of the chips part as well so uh, we don't really see that uh, in bring them and that is never a hindrance at at any point of uh, time so uh, so that is not a real uh, challenge and uh, as i said technology uh, which they have built in uh, also involves a lot of uh, integration across various facets so which also puts them in a very good uh, spot to uh, manage this kind of uh, challenges so we don't anticipate 
any of this being a big worry. Uh, again, on the stimulus part, because you raised this uh, question on this uh, pandemic, uh, the stimulus there was more done towards the, uh, you could say, the end consumption part of it because of these one, two months of uh, restrictions and all, uh, the consumption could have been impacted. So uh, the government came out with some stimulus packages more to encourage consumption. So nothing really had to be done because the manufacturing part never really got impacted in any, any significant manner. In fact, that will be quite uh, reassuring for investors as a whole because uh, this is something everyone was uh, talking about since quite some time. Uh, well, uh, Rajesh, another uh, point that has been doing the rounds is uh, China's growing influence on Taiwan um, and all these um, geopolitical tensions around it. Uh, what do you make of this situation and uh, how can it impact uh, Taiwan's long-term growth story? Sure. So uh, that is a overhang which has been there for uh, years. So uh, they have uh, uh, the, we could say, the, the diplomatic challenges with, with uh, China have persisted over the last many decades as far as uh, Taiwan is concerned. So China believes that Taiwan is, is part of their uh, country. In fact, recently uh, their top leaders have called for a reunification uh, wherein they say that Taiwan needs to be uh, part of China by 2025 and all the stuff which we keep uh, hearing. Uh, so while obviously geopolitical part is very difficult to uh, guess and even anticipate what can happen. Uh, one or two, three, uh, one couple of things which uh, we can we can remember uh, from from this perspective is first of all, China also has a lot of economic interest aligned with Taiwan. So as I was mentioning, Taiwan's uniqueness comes in uh, from its access to advanced technology, which a lot of other countries do not possess at this point of time. So China, being the largest trading partner, or most of the exports, or thirty percent of the exports roughly out of Taiwan actually go into uh, China. China actually looks at a lot of support from Taiwan when it comes to the technology front, especially the advanced technology part. So uh, given that kind of a thing, any aggressive kinds of stance uh, by China or even a military action by China would in some way hurt their own uh, economic interest to some extent. That is the uh, first uh, uh, point which I had to make. Secondly, these challenges have not been new. Taiwan has been facing these pressures for the last many decades, as I said, and still continue to scale up. In fact, today you could say it's, it resembles more of a developed nation, even though it's left as an emerging market economy. A lot of parameters, it actually resembles a developed nation. So it has actually been able to scale up to this level despite this kind of uh, challenges. Uh, again, some factor which a lot of us may not be aware of is uh, they also are uh, saddled with a lot of natural uh, disasters, calamities, natural challenges also. So from earthquake to drought is something which keeps happening on a recurring basis there. So despite all that anti caps they have been able to uh, scale up and achieve their unique status uh, as, as a manufacturer of electronics and advanced technology today. Secondly, uh, if you look at some of uh, the entire globe, uh, for the instance, which I mentioned, so 50% of the global production today of semiconductor or chips, and especially when it comes to the advanced kind of chips, almost a large proportion of that emanates out of Taiwan. So not only is China's economic interest linked to Taiwan, a lot of other countries, including uh, the most developed nations like US, uh, to a great extent even, even Japan and the European Union, have their own economic interest linked to uh, Taiwan. So any kind of instability that would have a indirect impact or even a direct impact in some of the economies, especially on the technological front. So the belief is uh, that all these nations would also be interested in having a peace uh, or peaceful kind of situation in Taiwan, and hence can uh, uh, use more of diplomacy there to, to help them come out of this kind of a uh, challenge. Uh, also geographically, how Taiwan is situated, it is, it is, it's a straight area. So it is in the South China uh, kind of sea. So if uh, any kind of military revolt or military action happens on that particular area, it can put some of the other uh, neighboring countries also, uh, uh, it can cause them a bit of a concern. So even those countries would be interested in trying to have uh, uh, Taiwan as a more uh, peaceful kind of uh, area. So all these factors are very important to keep note of. So the belief is globally, uh, what people believe is while this uh, pressures and, and the diplomatic tussles might uh, continue, uh, the fact is it will not lead to any 
significant or aggressive kind of uh, action uh, from from uh, either side and and uh, they might find a way out uh, to ensure that the economic interests are not uh, really uh, put at stake uh, because of these uh, challenges Uh, yes, Rajesh. In fact, you highlighted how uh, Taiwan has been resilient in, in spite of all these challenges. And um, that's one factor that uh, investors uh, should definitely bear in mind. Uh, these overhangs will persist from time to time. Though. Also, you can see, in a way, Taiwan is indispensable when it comes to the uh, uh, chip manufacturing or the electronic space itself as a whole. And as I mentioned to you, the usage is quite diverse today. So, in, in some way, you can say the entire world today has some kind of a linkage with uh, what is coming out of Taiwan as, as the end product, uh, which, which goes into their own uh, drive to improve upon technology, upgrade upon technology. So, the impact will be at a, felt at a very, very global kind of uh, level. So the belief is the entire world uh, will, will be there to try and get a uh, possibly a better way out instead of having a, a very aggressive kind of position. Absolutely. And uh, you, taking all of these factors into account now, uh, can you uh, elaborate on the features of the Nippon India Taiwan Equity Fund and uh, how it's going to work? So uh, what we have done here, obviously, we are not experts when it comes to uh, Taiwan as a market. So for starters, we have uh, tied up with uh, Cathay site, Cathay Securities uh, Investment Trust. Uh, which is the largest asset manager out of uh, Taiwan. And they are part of a very large uh, financial uh, uh, conglomerate, uh, which is which is there, which is called uh, Cathay Financial Holding, uh, which is incidentally a Fortune uh, 500 company. Uh, so we have tied up with them to help us with the advisory services. So they will help us uh, uh, invest there and try and uh, help us with our stock uh, selection as well. What we intend to do in this particular portfolio is to have a reasonably high conviction kind of portfolio approach with about 30, 35 uh, stocks uh, with a multi-cap kind of uh, bias. You could see a mix of uh, giant and large cap kind of names along with uh, the more faster growing uh, mid and uh, small cap kind of uh, businesses uh, as well. The key factors uh, which we will look at uh, from an investment selection point of view uh, would be three uh, in, in nature. So one would be uh, those set of businesses uh, which have a dominant market share uh, because of their differentiated uh, technology and, and that can be a big mode for them. Uh, second would be to also try and look at those set of businesses uh, which have very good margins today and which can be sustained going forward because either because the entry barrier itself is too high or uh, because they are into a very differentiated, more advanced kind of uh, technology. Uh, also, we would prefer those set of businesses uh, where uh, the, the product which they manufacture has got a very big mass demand kind of scenario. So that will ensure reasonable demand visibility uh, from a medium term uh, perspective. Uh, one interesting factor which we are doing here is uh, we are capping investments into a single stock at not more than 10%. So what will have, happen is there will be fair amount of diversification between the portfolio itself. Uh, and uh, typically if you look at uh, how the market cap weighted index, indexes behave, uh, one single company out of Taiwan today has a significant high, uh, significantly higher uh, market capitalization, preferred market capitalization. So that company roughly has about 30-35% kind of weightage in the uh, index, uh, the Taiwan Stock Exchange uh, index there. So that we will not go into that kind of thing. So we'll keep it less than 10% in a single uh, stock. So adequate amount of diversification will be uh, built in. Uh, from a sectoral point of view, how that uh, portfolio is constructed and how the benchmark index itself is there, uh, you could see about 60-70% roughly going into the electronic stroke, semiconductor stroke, uh, communication devices kind of uh, space because all of them have some kind of uh, linkage. Rest would be more uh, diversified into other segments like consumers, into uh, financials and stuff like that. We, we attempt to try and offer a differentiated uh, play here uh, from an Indian investor's uh, perspective and which tries to capture the real uniqueness, the real advantage which Taiwan brings to this. Sure. Uh, so, in essence, this will be an actively managed fund by Cathay 
and Nippon will be replicating the portfolio. Absolutely, that's that's perfect understanding. So they already have a fund uh, which runs on similar characteristics, which will attempt to uh, closely track and obviously try to resemble it to a large extent. But it will be based on an advisory uh, intimation which we will receive from them on a regular uh, basis, and accordingly the portfolio construct uh, would would happen. Okay, so another big differentiator here there is that it's not a fund of fund format, which a lot of um, AMCs typically follow. Right, so we will be investing directly. Uh, and I think that suits us also, because then we can ensure that all our required uh, guidelines are adhered to uh, without having any challenges, because the underlying fund uh, is in a, a different geography, different jurisdiction. So at times the regulations can uh, vary. Uh, also, there again, uh, just to point out, uh, we have been managing similar strategies on the US and the uh, Japan side, where we have been investing directly with, with uh, advisory support in both these geographies, uh, from experts in both these geographies. And uh, it's, it's worked quite smooth for us. We've been uh, managing these funds with at least five, six years history now, so, which is very quite, quite confident, even with the Taiwan equity, uh, it will not be a big challenge from our operational aspects. Sure. And uh, the other important factor is um, that uh, since you will be availing advisory services, how often will uh, the stock and sector changes be rebalanced um, at Nippon's end in line with uh, what Cathay is doing? So there's no set frequency for it. So just like uh, how it typically happens in India with all the open ended actively managed uh, funds, uh, the rotation, uh, the changes can be quite regular depending upon the uh, information flow, the market kind of movements, the visibility and everything. So that's how it will happen. So there's no set frequency for it. Uh, but every time a change uh, is envisaged at their end, that will be communicated. So it can be uh, uh, quite regular uh, depending upon how, uh, as I said, the news flow, the market movements and everything happens. We can accordingly have changes to the portfolio. Okay, uh, so some of the other important factors uh, that we are curious to know about is uh, stuff like PER, uh, the minimum uh, SIP or lump sum amounts and exit loads. Uh, so can you take us through those as well? Sure, basically uh, the TER would be in line with a lot of thematic uh, funds uh, which will find find so that's the category where this will fit into. So it will be pretty uh, similar. So depends. So TR obviously is a combination of multiple uh, factors, including what kind of mobilizations we're able to do in the particular uh, fund. So it could could be in that uh, normal range which you see for uh, most of the thematic uh, funds of similar size uh, and similar uh, equity funds in the thematic uh, space. From an exit load uh, perspective, uh, we are going to have an exit uh, load period of up to three months. 1% for uh, three months or so beyond which uh, there's going to be no uh, exit load there. Many of investments happens to be 500 uh, rupees here uh, for this particular uh, product category. Even SIP uh, can be started uh, with that kind of an amount. So, so the idea is to try and encourage and look at uh, times to have uh, portfolio diversification. So I'm sure advisors like you uh, look at uh, diversification across geographies apart from diversification across asset classes. So then we think uh, uh, Taiwan Equity Fund, Nippon Inter Taiwan Equity Fund offers an interesting space where investors can look at some bit of diversification from an international perspective uh, within their overall allocation part. So that's where uh, we think it, it can merit some allocations. All right. Uh, so Rajesh, um, now that you've touched upon all the relevant parameters, which I'm sure were in the minds of everyone uh, watching this video, um, any other points in the context of um, the NFO or uh, Taiwan that you would like to communicate? A couple of uh, key pointers here. One, obviously the uniqueness of this uh, uh, market uh, comes in from the fact that the technology which they operate with is, is quite differentiated. The entry barriers are quite high as I mentioned. So uh, it cannot be easily replicated even though there are obviously efforts on everywhere in the world today to uh, make themselves or by countries to make themselves more self-sufficient as far as uh, the semiconductor requirements is concerned. Some of the advanced technology is something which is not going to be easy to uh, scale up to. It 
it takes quite a bit of time for a lot of others to catch up with and and therein you could you could see uh, uh, the taiwan's advantage uh, being sustaining for a reasonably long period of time also uh, let's not confuse uh, this to a single segment kind of notion as i said the applicability is is quite varied here uh, when it comes to the chips or the semiconductors and they happen to be the brain of the technology part and all of us today believe that technology revolution or transformation is is here to stay and possibly only accelerate as as we uh, go forward so that technology touches us in our everyday lives in some form or the other so most of us in india itself are aware of uh, the potential uh, which this particular segment has and that's an opportunity uh, which indian investors today are uh, uh, can potentially target through a offering like this uh, something which is not available uh, otherwise uh, from my indian context so in, in india we don't have a similar kind of uh, businesses available uh, to invest in so when we talk about india especially the information technology as a space it's more to do with software and it services whereas here we are talking come something very different possibly you could say in a crude way more of hardware uh, when it comes to uh, taiwan so we are able to invest best in class businesses in this particular area and uh, that's the access uh, which we attempt uh, and endeavor to provide uh, for an offering uh, like this and uh, we believe uh, the opportunities here are reasonably uh, uh, good market from a valuation point of view because that's one a common question a lot of people have uh, because the run up uh, on the equity side has been there across most geographies over the last uh, 12 to 15 months uh, where valuations are little in line or slightly higher than the historical averages in most of the geographies so therein taiwan if you look at from valuation perspective is actually little below their historical uh, averages so even on a relative term market valuation on the equity side looks reasonably attractive another interesting aspect uh, of the equity markets there in taiwan is almost uh, a good part you could say roughly two thirds of the uh, equity volumes trading volumes which happen there uh, come from domestic set of investors both individuals and institutions put together so there is a lot of resilience there so they don't get impacted so much by international inflows or outflows as the case may be uh, because the domestic market itself is a got a reasonable support Uh, uh from the domestic investors itself so we believe this uh, market itself is uh, quite interesting so both technology uh, at a economic level and uh, the uh, market valuations from a equity perspective uh, look very well along with the fact that the earnings growth has been very good just like as most of the other parts of the world and we think this dynamics uh, or support drivers are likely to continue for a reasonable uh, period of time and uh, our investors uh, can use this opportunity to try and have some bit of diversification international diversification in their portfolios and it uh, a product like this can create some allocation of this absolutely uh, in fact on uh, that note uh, we shall wrap up the video but not before thanking rajesh for uh, taking us comprehensively through so many nuances and busting so many myths that uh, people typically associate with uh, semiconductors and taiwan in general thank you thank you uh, krishna and thank you the actors team for having us here